Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Love that song. If you've never heard of City of Light, you need to check them out. Um, if you have Spotify, um, I've got them on my account. They're just a wonderful group. Great worship music there. So, anyways, turn your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter number 1. Gospel of John, chapter 1. If you are a guest this morning, thank you for being our guest. We're glad that you're here. We have begun a new series. Um, we just started last Sunday. We're going through the Gospel of John chapter by chapter, in some cases, verse by verse. And so we are looking at what John is showing to us, and that is Jesus Christ. I've entitled the series, This is Jesus, because that's exactly what John is doing as he writes this gospel. As you read through this entire gospel, John is constantly and consistently saying in a roundabout way as you read, this is who Jesus is. This is who he is. Now, last week when we began our study, we found that John shows us that Jesus is God. He came to us, God in the flesh, and dwelt among us. As a matter of fact, in John 1.1 1, 1, and in verse number 14, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do is I'm going to begin now in verse number four because we covered verses one through three last Sunday, and I'm going to start in verse four today and try to get through verse number 13 if I can. Okay? We will try to get there. Verse, I think I can do it if you'll hold out. It's 10 after. I know that... Um, we had a lot going on today, and so with communion and everything, our time kind of slips by pretty quick. So um, if you'll bear with me, I would like to get through this because what John tells us here in this text is so, so important. It's so theologically deep. It is so rich, so rich with doctrine that I don't want to miss this, and I don't want you to miss it either. I do want to say on a side note, as we um, continue on through the Gospel of John, from this moment on, I want you to see the different times in the Gospel as we travel through how John shows us the attributes of Christ in that we can know that Jesus is is God in the flesh, who came as God in the flesh. We can see this because of the attributes that Jesus holds that you only see in God the Father. For instance, in John 2, verses 1 through 11, we see the attribute of omnipotence or the all-powerful God. We see Jesus as that having that attribute. In John 2, verse 24, we see the attribute of omniscience, that God knows all things, Jesus knows all things. In John 6, we see the attribute of holiness. And then in John 14, we see the attribute of truth. And the list will continue to go on and on. And as we're going through the gospel, you'll hear me just kind of give a little snippet of, here's an attribute of Christ that we also see as an attribute of God, which also confirms him as to be God in the flesh. Now, what I want to do now is let's get into our text, verse number four through verse 13. Let me read the text. I have three very simple points as far as an outline goes, but I want to leave you with two great thoughts before you leave, which is at the end of your notes. So um, three great truths. Um, those three great truths are, or the three points that I have in here is we see the revelation of light. We see the rejection of the light, and we see the receiving of the light. And I entitled my message this morning, The Light That Gives Life. Jesus is the life, and he is the light that has come into the world to give life to men. To give life? Well, I thought we were already living. What do you mean he came to give us life? Listen, I want you to understand, he didn't come to give you life that some people are expecting, that he's going to give you a better life, that he's going to give you a life that's filled with unicorns and rainbows and flowers and a life that's a life of ease and a life of plenty or a life of prosperity or a life of health. Jesus didn't come 
to give us a better life, but he came to give us life, and that life that he came to give was life eternal. Life with the Father. So, with that, let me read the text, and we'll start right back, and and let me give you the three points real quick. Verse 4. In him, in Christ, was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Now, verses 6 through 8, I'm not going to touch today because that's going to be my sermon next Sunday. Um, So kind of bear with me with that. We're going to skip over those as I preach. Verse 9. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now, let me just kind of pause real quick. Verse 9, that text, if you have, I read out of the New King James Version because this is the Bible that Jesus read. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Some of y'all get that. Some of y'all like, whatever. Okay. I'm joking completely, right? I am not a King James Version guy. I am, I use the New King James Version because that's what I cut my teeth on. How many of you cut your teeth on the King James Version, right? All you 50 and older. Because that's all there was, right? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) But I cut my teeth on that. I know everywhere in Scripture, the verses that I have memorized and everything is cut into the New King James Version, which takes out the these and the thous and the thuses and all that stuff and the old King's English. And so, therefore, I use this because this is what I cut my teeth on. But if you read other translations like the ESV, or the NASB, that verse may read like this. That verse would read, that was the true light, which coming into the world gives light to every man. Now, when you look at this text, the word coming into the world is referring to the light that came. And this is speaking of Jesus's incarnation. This is speaking of him coming into the world. That verse is not to say that it's every man coming into the world, but it's Jesus who came into the world gives light to every man. Now, just, I just wanted you to see that, just so you understand that. Verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let's pray, and let's dig in this morning. Father, uh, Lord, I have such a great task before me, your word, which is true, pure, which is alive, which is your word to us. And my task this morning, I'm afraid, Father, is too much for me. God, I am just a man. And I'm asking, Father, that you would help me, Holy Spirit, that you would fill me and that you would use me as I teach your word. I pray that there's not a person here that would leave this building this morning not knowing who Jesus is and what he has done. May they not leave this place not knowing that he is the light who has come into the world that to give eternal life to men, to those who receive him as Lord and Savior. I pray, God, that they would understand that and know that today. Help me, Father, use me. Um, Transform us through your word today, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. First of all, number one, the revelation of the light or the reveal. You could also use the word the revealing of the light is found in verse four. As John says, in him was life and life was the light of men. In him was life. What was this life? This means life itself. This is the means of life or the substance of life. Jesus is life. In other words, um, he is the life that is ever existing. He is the life that is ever eternal. Everything exists because he is life. He is the giver, the sustainer of life. All things were made by him and through him, verse 3, and nothing was made that was made because everything was made through him. We understand that Jesus was here before Life began because he is life. Uh, J.C. Ryle said this. He said, in the eternal councils of the Trinity, Christ was appointed to be the source, fountain, origin, and cause of life. 
From him, all life is to flow. All life is to flow. For instance, um, some would tell you who are atheists that do not believe in God, they would tell you that first there was matter. Um, They have different ideas on how life began, but say one we all have heard of, the Big Bang theory, and that matter was in matter. In other words, matter was in this space. And we're trying to figure out how the space got there. But this matter was in space, and matter exploded with a great profusion of, 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 of tremendous power. And through that, the solar system was created, which then in turn, in that solar system, there was some, and I don't even know the, tech, the scientific names for all those little life organisms, those amoebas or whatever they're called, came together in the primordial soup. And from there, there was born life. And through a billion years, here you are. Whew, that was easy. (laughs) Now, that's what an atheist would tell you. But here's the thing. We need to understand that life was before matter. Life was in existence before matter. What are you talking about, Pastor? Jesus was in existence before matter. Why? Because we know the Bible says that all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In other words, Jesus, we learned this last Sunday, created everything. He created all matter. Then he created all life. Everything living, plants, animals, vegetables, vegetation, us, human beings. He is life, and we have life because he is life. So, what is John saying here? Well, I think you can understand that John, in this text, we could understand that in him was life. Yes, that is true. He is the beginner, the sustainer, the origin of life, but the life that John, I believe, is referring to here as we continue through the text, because if you stay in the text, you understand that this word life is not meaning so much that he is the origin and the sustainer, but he is life. And what I mean by that is Jesus is life eternal. Jesus never had a beginning, and he will never have an end because he always is and always was and always will be. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Are you with me? You see, so Christ is life, and that life that is He is, that is Him, is eternal. And so the life here that John is speaking of, in Him was life, life eternal. This is who Jesus is, the source of life eternal. And this is the life that Jesus gives to men. Now listen to the text, these verses that I have before you, how this life is everlasting. John 3, 15 and 16, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 4, 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will thirst, will never thirst, excuse me, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. John 5, 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. John 6, 47, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has Ever, you get the idea, right? John 10, 27, 20, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, they follow me and I give them life. eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. John 17, 2, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give what? Eternal life to as many as you have given him. 
1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Life eternal. And finally, 1 John 5, 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little snippet. There's Jesus Christ and his attribute as being God where he said, this is the true God. This is the true God and eternal life. In him was life. Verse 4, in him was life and, notice what else John says, not only is Jesus life, but John also says that, and the life was the light of men. Jesus is the light who shines light unto men. Jesus, who is life, brings light to men. This is the revelation of the light. Jesus said that he is that light. John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 9, 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So we see the revealing of this light. This light is Jesus. He is the eternal one, the eternal existing one. He will be for as has been forever in the past, present, and always will be because he is God. He is God in the flesh. Of course, we know verse 14, when he refers to him as the word, he became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But notice with me now in verse number 5 through 11, we see the rejection of this light. Verse 5, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 9, that was the true light, which coming into the world gives light to every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. John tells us that Jesus, who is the light, shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness does not comprehend it. Why is it that John tells us in verse 10, the world didn't know him? Why does John tells us, tell us that his own didn't even receive him? His own meaning that Jesus came to Israel. He came to the Jews. He was prophesied in the Old Testament that the Messiah was going to come. And yet they rejected him. And the answer is verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. What is Darkness. What, what is this darkness? The word darkness in the Greek means the realm of sin and evil. The realm of sin and evil. This is what Jesus came into. You understand that when Jesus came into this world, he didn't come into a world that was right. He didn't come into a world that was perfect. He didn't come into the world that had it together. He didn't come into a world... That was holy and perfect and pure. He came into a world that was what? Broken, sinful, in darkness. He came into a world that is in darkness. You say, I don't, I don't believe you. Let me ask you a question. Let's just say, for instance, let's just imagine. Let's just say you take out every Christian today, everyone who is a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, take them out of the world right now, and what do you have left? You got chaos. You got, well, we got chaos now, right? I mean, you've got every form of sin and darkness, debauchery, filth, vulgar. You've got everything that is dark dark, every type of evil, every type of sin that you have left on this earth. You see, when Christ came, he came to an earth, to a, to a, to a world of darkness. And so John says, the light shines in the darkness. He has come to this world, a world that is in darkness. And notice 
and the darkness did not comprehend it, verse 5. The word comprehend has two meanings. It's kind of like, um, I was trying to think of this, like, um, you ever hear people when you're, when, they're, um, when you're talking to them, you're trying to explain something to them, and they use the phrase and go, I caught that, right? Now, that has two meanings, right? I caught that, like catching a ball, and I caught that. Are y'all with me? Some of y'all are just kind of looking at me like, you're still looking at the new pulpit, aren't you? That you just can't get your eyes off it. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but it's the same meaning. The word comprehend has two meanings to it. And these two meanings are this. The first one is this. The first one means to overcome. It means to gain control over. Now, we understand and know that the realm of sin and evil will never gain control over Christ. Come on, right? We all know that. Satan, evil and sin cannot, over, he, listen, he was victorious over sin and death, right? He rose from the grave. We just celebrated that just a few Sundays ago at Easter. So we know that the realm of sin and evil will never gain control of Christ. And here's the thing, light always overcomes darkness and there's no other way around it. There's no other way around it. Think about this. Um, we have a closet in our living room. So when you walk into our house, our front door, right there on the left is our coat closet. Some of y'all have coat closets, right? Our coat closet has no light in it. And when the door is shut, it's dark in there. I mean, it's just dark in there, except for maybe a, a little bit of light that could escape through the bottom, but we got thick carpet and so it cuts off everything. It's like completely dark. And how do I know that? Because when we play hide and go seek with the kids, that's where I go. <laughs> and it's funny, man, because Sierra and Caleb, they're seven years old. What's that? Oh, they are. My kids are in here. That's right. Another hiding spot. Another hiding spot. That's right. I'll go down way down in the basement in the deep, dark place. They never go in there. So they're not there. <laughs> but anyways, let me, let, me, let me explain this. So, 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 so here's the thing. There's no light in there and there's darkness in there. But here's the strange thing that happens. When I open the door to the closet... The funny thing happens is the darkness that's in there doesn't come out into the light and overtake the light. But yet the light that's in the living room overtakes the darkness in the closet. You go, duh, that's how light works. Do you know that's exactly how Jesus works too? Jesus overcomes the darkness. So this overcome, if you will, or this Yes, is to understand that sin and evil will never overcome Christ. The second meaning of that is to understand. So as he says in verse 5, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. That means to understand. It means to come to understand something which was not understood or perceived previously. Now think about this. The Bible tells us that his own didn't receive him. The Jews of his day rejected him. They didn't understand that he was saying or doing. They didn't comprehend what he was saying. They were blinded. They were opposed to him. And in the end, they killed him. Why? Because they were in darkness. He came as the prophets foretold to God's chosen people, and they rejected him. But they rejected him because of verse 5. They are in darkness. And the same is true today. Millions of people reject even Jesus today. Why? For the same reason they rejected him when he walked this earth, because they are in darkness. Listen to this text, John 3, 19. Listen to what he says. Jesus says, this is the, or John said, and this is the condemnation. The light has come into the world, and men loved darkness, Jesus said, rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light. Why, lest his deeds should be exposed. 1 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man, Paul says, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You want to know why people reject God? Because they're in darkness. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blind. Who's the God of this age? 
who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18 says, This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life, eternal life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts. The reason why people reject Jesus yesterday and the day before and the day after and continue to reject Jesus today because they are in the dark. They are in darkness. John Piper said, people don't see Jesus as supremely valuable. They don't see him as precious because they are blind. They walk in darkness. They are spiritually dead to these greatest of all realities. In order to see him, they must have life. Life will make seeing possible. Life brings light. And that's why in verse 4, when John said, In him was life, and that life, that life was the light to men. Are you with me? That life, that eternal life, that was the light to men, calling them out of darkness into his marvelous light. That was the light to us that drew us out of darkness. That was, we were able to see the light. So we see the rejection of the light and then the receiving of the light. And please, if you'll hold with me just for a few moments. The receiving of light. I'm almost done. Notice that John tells us that those who, read Jesus, who receive Jesus are those who believe in him. Back to our text in John 1. He says in verse number 11, he came to his, or verse number 12, excuse me. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. The receiving of Christ is this, that when we receive Jesus As our Savior, what God, or He, excuse me, Christ, gives us the right to become adopted children of God. Why? Because we believe, we've received and believed in His name. That's the receiving of Christ. We become children of God. What a glorious thing when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become children of God. Galatians 3.26 says, For you were all sons of God through faith in Not the church, not your prayers, not your giving, not in me, but in Christ. In Christ. The receiving of the light is when we believe. And that believe is to put your faith in Christ. It's not a belief that says, I think he's real. I think I I think I know who he is, and I've got a 50-50 shot, so I'll believe. That's not faith. That's not trust. That's not belief. Putting your faith in Jesus Christ is knowing that when he died on the cross, he died for every single one of your sins. That he was paying your penalty, your he was taking God's wrath upon himself, The penalty for your sin, he took upon himself. And that believing that, knowing that it's nothing in and of ourselves that can get us into the kingdom of heaven, but it is only through Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. It's through him. And that is it. That is it. But a question has to be asked, and that question is this. How do we receive that light? Now stick with me for just a moment. How do we receive that light? If we are in darkness, then how do we receive that light? If we are walking in dark, listen, before I was saved at the age of 23, I walked in darkness. Before you were born again, you walked in darkness. Before you received Christ as your Savior, you walked in darkness. Everybody, every, every one of your Christians ought to say, Amen. 
because every single one of you fulfilled the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath. We were all walking in darkness, but one day, the glorious light of Jesus Christ shone and we were born again. How do we see the light? As John says in verse 13, notice who were born. Born. What do you mean born? Like we're all born. No, not physical birth. This is spiritual birth. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, listen, but of God. The light is received by being born again. Listen to what verse 4 again says in the beginning of our text. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus is the life, and that life, Jesus, is the light of men. In other words, the light which opens the eyes of men who are in darkness is Jesus who is life. <laughs> I don't think y'all hear me. <laughs> because that's profound. The light which opens the eyes of men who are in darkness is Jesus who is life. You did not know Jesus till Jesus came to you. He came to you. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Jesus said, no man can come to me except by the Father drawing him. We all understand that truth, that theological, doctrinal truth, that God draws men to himself. And he draws us. We're in darkness. We're not in darkness Going, I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus because I want all my sins to be brought to light. No, we're loving it. We're loving darkness. We love living in darkness until the Holy Spirit came a knocking at our door. And he revealed to us our sinful condition. And he revealed to us the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And by faith, we were like, yes. But it all has to do with the light that opens our eyes who walked in darkness is Jesus. And this light which opens the eyes of men is a work of God which we call being born again. Think about this. Just as the first creation began, when out of darkness, God said, let there be light. <laughs> Boom! And there was light. Light didn't spring up on its own. It didn't create itself. Light wasn't off in the distance going, my turn, my turn, I'm coming in now. God spoke, said, let there be light in the darkness, and it became light. So the new creation begins with the entrance of light into the heart of the believer who is walking in darkness when God says, let there be light. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 tells us, for it is the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Who did? God did. He delivered us. Man, this makes me want to shout. I don't know why. Maybe it's the pulpit, but man, I'm excited today. <laughs> I can finally lean on something and it holds me. <laughs> I'm not a pulpit slamming preacher or anything like that, but wow. This is awesome, man. That God has delivered us. We didn't come out of darkness on our own. We didn't wake up one day by osmosis and go, I think I'll follow God today. I think I'll give him my heart. I think I'll believe in him. No, it doesn't work that way. We know it doesn't work that way. Anyone who is born again knows it never worked that way. 
It wasn't until God got a hold of you and you were born again. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you will proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And now let me close this quote of I'll stop because I know the kids and everything. And, but being called out of darkness and given light is what we call being born again. That's what it's all about. But this whole work of being born again is a work of God. Understand that, my friend. Being born again is not your work. It's a work of God. That's why he said, who were born, verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's why grace is so amazing. That's why God is so awesome and wonderful. And yes, because he has done it all. He chose me. He redeemed me. He pulled me out of darkness into his marvelous light. He made me who was a son of the devil, a son of God. Jesus did this. The Bible also says in 1 John 5, 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is or has been born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten. I'm going to leave you these two thoughts, and I'm close right here. You can even close your Bibles. Here's the two thoughts. You ready? These are cool. These are, these are shout for joy, slap your mama good stuff right here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not slap your mama. <laughs> I mean, I mean, good. Yeah, yeah. How, how many of you like biscuits? How many of you ever had really good biscuits how many ever had good biscuits with molasses now i'm not talking about walmart molasses don't or the dylan's brand i'm talking some real good high dollar molasses and you pour it on top of that we call them big cat head biscuits right that mama makes by home i'm not talking about the pillsbury that we ate saturday morning from the store and you put it i'm talking about scratch kneading big old cat head biscuits y'all know what i'm talking about I mean, they are so good, you put molasses, if you were to put it on top of your head, your tongue would beat your brains out trying to get to that biscuit. That's how good, <laughs> that's how good these two points are. <laughs> now, th- <laughs> Listen to these, and these, what I want you to walk away with, I want you to leave with these two thoughts. Number one is Jesus shows you life when you could never find it on your own. Jesus shows you life when you could never find it on your own. John 12, 46, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. I love that. Number two, Jesus gives you life when you could never get it on your own. John 5, 21, for as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. And here's the thing. Just as John said, to receive Christ is to believe in his name. Are you born again? Do you know the light that gives life to men? That is Jesus. And in order for you to be born again, in order for you to have this eternal life, in order for you to have a relationship with the Father. And by the way, this whole thing works simultaneously together as one. God opens our eyes. We see the truth. We believe we are born again, and it happens. I always tell people in a nanosecond. I don't even know how fast a nanosecond is, but it's fast. It's fast. That's all I know. It's fast. And it all works together. And if we are to have a relationship with the Father, if we are to be born again, we must receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. So let me encourage you today that if you've never been born again, you've never received the light, you've never asked Christ to be your Savior, then my friend, you need to do that today. You say, Pastor, I don't know how to do all that. I don't know how to pray that prayer. I don't even know what what, what am I supposed to do? What's the first step? Get with me and talk. I'd love to sit down with you and through Scripture show you exactly There is no magic prayer. There is no incantation. There is no right words to say. But when God reveals to your heart, just like he did, I was a 23-year-old drug addict, 
porn, every filth, nasty, in the dark. And when Jesus came to me, I didn't have to have anyone explain to me that I was dying and going to hell because God opened my eyes that Sunday morning on that old wood slatted pew and that little itty bitty Baptist church all the way in the back because I couldn't wait to get out the doors to smoke my Marlboro Reds. <laughs> and when I heard the gospel message, I'd heard the gospel message before. I knew that God was real. I knew that Jesus was real. I, I believed all that. But I never believed. When the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ came real to me and the light of Christ showed me, I was gloriously born again. And I knew I had been forgiven. I knew that Christ had redeemed me and purchased me and forgave me of all of my sins. Back on that pew at Central Baptist Church in Arcadia, Florida. But it wasn't until then that Christ gave me light, and I received that light. And I want to encourage you to receive the light, to receive Christ by receiving him as your Lord and Savior. Let's all stand together. We'll dismiss this morning. Thank you so much for your kind attention and for your, your patience. I mean, the kids did great today, amen? I mean, even the pastor's kids, I didn't even hear them once. <laughs> That was good. Hey, listen, parents, I want you to know it doesn't matter. The kids, can, you know, they're not disturbing me, okay? So don't let that bother, bother you, okay? We're in here together as a family, okay? And everyone needs to hear the Word of God. Everyone needs to be a part of worship service, and we're glad that the entire Children's Church group is in here with us. Amen? Amen. There was just a few on that one. <laughs> But anyways, keep praying. God is truly blessing our church. As you can see, as you look around, we are getting more and more packed. And so we want you to continue to come. We want you to continue to grow. So please continue to be a part of this. Listen to the gospel of John. Continue to let God change you and grow you and transform your life. All right, let's dismiss in prayer. And as we do, James Junod, would you uh, dismiss us in prayer, please?